Ladies and gentlemen, let us now turn with uh, the great tone set for the day to our keynote speaker to start us this morning. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the Director General of DG Energy. Please welcome Dieter Jorg Jorgensen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning to, to everyone. Um, there's a lot to be worried about, there's a lot to be concerned about, as we have just heard and seen, but there's also a lot we can do, and I would like to try to focus on that in my remarks to you uh, this morning. Our approach to uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, our approach to the energy crisis that we have been living through over the last year and a half, has forced us to take action, to take action together, to take action swiftly. And we have, of course, in doing that, focused on what can we do ourselves. There are many things out there outside our control, and you've seen some of them, but there are things we can do, uh, and that's what I would like to talk about. It's a bit more than a year ago that the Repower EU plan was adopted, the plan to uh, phase out our dependence on Russian fossil fuels in particular, um, a strategy to, first of all, uh, become stronger, more secure, to have cleaner energy, uh, and to have affordable energy, also in this changing geopolitical context and energy market context. As you know, it builds on three pillars. We need to reduce our demand, we need to be more energy efficient, we need to save energy, we need to accelerate and scale up the deployment of renewables, uh, a more secure, homegrown source of energy. And then, of course, we need to make sure that we replace those Russian molecules, all the molecules that Russia took out of the global market. We need to replace those with molecules, clean molecules where that is possible, or fossil molecules where that is necessary for more uh, reliable um, suppliers. And that's just what we did. From the presentation of the plan, um, setting out our ambition to reduce our dependence on Russian gas by two-thirds at the end of the year. I think the response was more or less unanimous in saying that cannot be done. You're too dependent, the change is too swift, it's too much. But we did do it, uh, and I would like to say a few words about what happened and, and what have we learned from that. And then looking ahead, how do we use those lessons? How do we use that uh, in developing um, our energy policy further? This is always a moment when I talk about it where I launch into a very long list of things we did, things that succeeded, instruments we gave ourselves, policy tools we gave ourselves, legislation that was passed, and I will spare you that long list. You've been living through it, you've been seen, seeing it, and you've been having to adapt to that very, very quickly as these emergency legislation uh, um, uh, was adopted um, and, uh, uh, and as markets changed very, very uh, rapidly. Um, but what we do know is that there are still a number of challenges out there. Markets are calmer, we have put in place a number of measures to, to calm markets, uh, we have put in place measures to continue to reduce demand, to really try to stabilize and to get more secure uh, supplies. But the uncertainties are out there, uh, the pandemic is calm, we're not quite sure where that's going, the energy crisis is ongoing, the Russian war in Ukraine is very much ongoing, we see extreme weather conditions that impact our energy sector very significantly, um, and so we do need to look at what do we do in that context. And if I start with some of the lessons learned over this past year and a half of energy crisis, um, it's clear that we are stronger together. And it sounds very obvious, but I think it has become clear to everyone across the European Union, all member states, all actors, that we are stronger together. That there are challenges that are of a nature that requires joint action that no one, not one member state, can manage on their own. So let us make the most of this interdependence. Let's make the most uh, of our cooperation uh, so that we build the best possible approaches to tackle the change to be ready for the change that is in any case happening uh, around us. We saw solidarity mechanisms, we saw joint uh, market uh, in, um, uh, integration, uh, we saw the role of regional groups, we've gone to joint purchasing of natural gas to strengthen our position. All of this were common measures that no one would have thought possible before, but that saw broad support, uh, consensus among member states, um, and so that working together and the strength of working together is the first lesson learned. If anyone was in doubt before, it is very, very clear. The second lesson learned is being together and being stronger together is not just about Europe, it's also about international partnerships. 
Over the course of the energy crisis, we built stronger partnerships with uh, some of our already close allies, but really bringing that alliance, bringing that cooperation to a completely different level, the EU-US uh, Energy Security Task Force and cooperation between the two presidents is a good example of that, but also other neighboring countries, Norway stepped up, the UK uh, uh, provided helpful infrastructure in, in securing gas to the European Union, and of course, all our neighbors uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, with whom we have built closer partnerships and alliances for energy over this last year, and where we have a lot of interesting work um, ahead. And then, of course, our immediate neighborhood, the Western Balkans, Ukraine and Moldova, we are talking about a two-way strengthened cooperation uh, to help those that need help and those that need to be closer uh, to us. Um, the third point I would mention in terms of lessons learned from what has happened over this last year is try to build on our strengths. We had a weakness, the dependence on Russian gas, and we had a number of strengths, our internal market, our inter interconnectedness, the existing infrastructure, our, uh, our ability uh, to work together, the investment conditions. So what we have tried to do in all of the crisis response is to build on that, to make sure that the response to the crisis would strengthen and confirm our internal market as our key value, also when it comes to energy. The need for interconnections, the need to work together, the need to make use of the trade partnerships we have, and then the need for solidarity, really making solidarity operational. The principle is there, but we have needed to strengthen and clarify what does it mean when you are in an actual crisis? How do we best uh, prepare for that? The fourth lesson learned is uh, something that Christian also uh, touched upon in his introductory remarks, the crisis response was aligned and had to be aligned with the response to the climate crisis, which is a, which is a parallel crisis that we are uh, facing. So we needed to make sure that everything we did in the crisis aligned with the objective, with the strategic objective of climate neutrality uh, in 2050, that we did not roll back on that objective, that we did not slow down that necessary change in our energy systems. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that uh, shortly because I will come to the electricity market design, which is a good example of lessons learned and how do we make sure we align that. We saw that the European Green Deal, uh, more renewables, more energy efficiency would be the best way to make us more secure, not just for green energy, not just for affordable energy, but really also for our security, our energy security and our economic uh, security. So we had to make sure that our response aligned with that and as um, I said, the Repower EU pillars are a complete alignment and support of that drive towards climate neutrality, building on energy efficiency and savings, and renewable energy um, as the most important sources and the most important pillars of our crisis response as well. Um, and that brings me to my fifth point, which is our economic security is very much about energy security and climate security. The security in, en in energy terms, the security in climate terms, are necessary and contribute to our economic security. And so we need to make sure that our policy objectives work together uh, for economic security, for strategic autonomy, for resilience of our energy systems, because only with resilient energy systems and only with that strategic autonomy will we also be economically secure and secure in a more classical, in a more classical sense. Um, we will be uh, adopting tomorrow a strategy on economic security, really drawing on the lessons learned over this last year, the lessons learned in the current geopolitical context, and making sure that we strengthen that, uh, that security. Uh, but again, the energy system and the climate system are, of course, central parts of economic uh, security. Um, that brings me to what are the longer term impacts of the crisis we have been through. How do we draw the lessons, not just in the immediate response, but also in how we develop, how we design our energy markets? What, what have we learned and what is necessary? Um, and of course, the first point is we need the green transition and we need to accelerate that. We need to make sure that we have a stable framework for that, a stable regulatory framework that incentivizes investments and protects uh, consumers. And that's, of course, our electricity market design. I hope we all agree that the electricity market design we have has served us very, very well over decades. It has given uh, energy security. 
the interconnectedness, the functioning markets has helped us uh, if the nuclear generation was low in one member state or if hydropower was low in another member state because of droughts and climate crisis or if there were other challenges in one part of Europe or the other. The, the uh, common energy market, the common electricity market and the way it is designed has made sure that the electrons would go where they were needed and at the best possible uh, conditions um, from a market perspective. We need to protect that and we need to take that with us into the future. But what we also learned during the crisis was that there were some elements of the market that could be strengthened, that could be designed in a cleverer way to help facilitate the transition, to help facilitate uh, and speed up the deployment of renewable energy, but also to protect consumers and create the best possible investment conditions for project developers um, and for those who operate um, in the market. And so that's what we have decided uh, to do. Uh, we put forward a proposal for a revision of the electricity market design earlier this year, and we are already way into the legislative uh, process. Uh, European energy ministers met yesterday in Luxembourg and, uh, and discussed the proposal, working towards a common position, a general approach that will allow us to go into the further legislative process with the two co-legislators, Council um, and Parliament. So what have we suggested in the proposal for electricity market design? Uh, and again, this is one of those moments where I risk speaking in great detail. I will try not to, just really the main points of the electricity market design proposal. First of all, we do try to separate the bill that consumers pay uh, from the short-term market volatility. We do not decouple prices, we do not remove the price setting system, we do not change the functioning of the market, we protect the short-term market, but we do make sure that there are opportunities uh, to, for consumers, uh, for industrial consumers or for household, to make sure that the bill they actually pay is not as volatile um, and unwieldy uh, as those short-term markets driven by the volatile fossil fuel prices and costs that we've seen over the last year. The second point is, of course, uh, and I've said it already, we need to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy uh, and the phase out of gas. And so we try to make the necessary design features that will help us do that and then will accelerate the transition. And then the third point that we try to achieve um, is to better protect electricity consumers from the market manipulation. Uh, we have the REMIT, uh, the REMIT system, we have got the monitoring uh, and the role of ACER, and we believe it's necessary to strengthen that in order to, to protect our markets and to make sure that the markets work properly and that consumers don't, don't suffer um, in challenging circumstances. And then fourth, more generally, more widely, we need to empower consumers, give them the possibility to, wherever possible, choose their energy mix, decide on the type of energy pricing they want that they think is right for them, whether they are industrial consumers or households, for them to have more access to uh, pricing arrangements, contractual arrangements that work uh, for their circumstances. Um, and so those are the objectives, um, and those objectives were largely welcomed both in the European Parliament and among European member states. There's no question of touching the short-term market. We need that for our security, we need that for our investments, but there is really full agreement, full support, consensus around these objectives. Uh, and we just have a little bit more technical work to make sure that we get the technical aspects of that right. And that's what energy ministers discussed last night uh, in Luxembourg. There was agreement on strengthening the market oversight, the monitoring and the enforcement, the remit. And there's agreement on consumer aspects, no doubt that we need to do it the way it has been proposed or close to that. And, and then there are some outstanding issues on what are the long-term pricing arrangements, how do we best use contracts for difference, also when there are new investments into, an, into existing capacity. And we need to work a little bit more to get that balance right, and we'll be doing that over the coming days together with ambassadors um, here in Brussels. And so I'm confident that there will be a general approach between member states soon, so that we can go into trilogue with the European Parliament once their position is established, to help bring certainty and predictability, a clear regulatory framework for our electricity market uh, as swiftly as possible, so that we can continue our common work on the energy transition for investments and for a well-functioning European electricity market that brings both secure, affordable and green energy to consumers. Thank you very much. Thanks.
stay, stay with us for a moment. Let's just um, end on that final point, if I may, because obviously the attention of the industry was what is the council going to agree? Are we going to get agreement on everything? And I have to say, you started your, your keynote talking about collaboration, everyone working together, coming to a common purpose, but there hasn't been agreement on that third part of the market design. You say you're confident. What's going to be needed to get that agreed? I think sometimes you are in a situation where everyone wants an agreement and everyone knows that the room for that agreement we, we know where it is, but sometimes things are also technically challenging and need just a little bit more preparatory work to make sure that we get the technical details right, because the technical details matter. So the direction is common, the landing zone is essentially agreed. The question is, how do we reflect that in the text that will go into the continued legislative process? And that's why I feel fairly confident that if we sit down together, give ourselves just a little bit more time with ambassadors here, that it will be possible to reach an agreement also on that third part. I'm sure you'd have loved to have stood up here this morning and said it was all agreed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will wait the next few days. Dita, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.